Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Tone Vase. I am the head of research at Brave New Coin. Uh, prior to that, um, I was writing for Coin Telegraph, and uh, I was writing for Coin Telegraph while still working in the traditional finance industry. Uh, my first job was at Bear Stearns in 2007, right before the financial crash, and then I moved on through J.P. Morgan and then other financial institutions like MSCI and Axiomai. If anyone heard of those. Um, and today's presentation is going to be about the speculative aspect of Bitcoin. And uh, we're going to run quickly through the history of how Bitcoin got to the price it's at today. And uh, I know I'm the last one standing between you and lunch. Uh, I'm going to try and talk quick. Uh, Everyone is now a Bitcoin expert here. Um, as well as, um, I'm going to sum up a lot of things all the previous speakers said before me. It was actually a perfect lineup because um, I agree with... What happened? Uh, because I agree with a lot of the things the previous speaker said. So, um, this is the history of Bitcoin on a logarithmic chart. It starts at about $2 down here, and it goes all the way to 1400 at the top. Uh, now, unfortunately, we don't have one exchange that has been around since 2010. Um, and even though uh, we at Brave New Coin have just developed a Bitcoin index that would take us back to 2010, uh, the next time I do this presentation, I will have this going back all the way to 2010 because we have an index that's joining uh, the old data with the new data. Uh, but for now, this is one of the exchanges. It doesn't really matter which one, but we do have prices going back to 2012, even though my chart is going to start off a little earlier than that. Um, so um, there were a couple of things that, that kicked off Bitcoin into the first double digit set of prices, taking it out of the 50 cent area, the 20 cent area, and uh, starting the very first uh, bubbles that we had before prices came down. There we go. And um, ironically, what really kicked it off was things in the United States. And um, one of the first things is now we're going back to 2010, December of 2010. Um, I don't know how many of you remember or have seen this before. Uh, this is Satoshi Nakamoto. This is back when he was still replying on Bitcoin Talk. And the, the comment he's replying to was, uh, the comment says, basically bring it on. Let's encourage WikiLeaks to use Bitcoins um, and are willing to face any risk or fallout from that act. Um, anyone know who said that? Who was encouraging WikiLeaks to use Bitcoin in 2010? Because what happened in late December 2010 was the credit card industries and PayPal and all the other traditional methods cut off WikiLeaks from any kind of funding and people were not able to donate. Um, so the person that said that was uh, Amir Taki. Uh, he's one of the developers of Dark Wallet. And uh, Satoshi Nakamoto replied saying, no, don't bring it on. Bitcoin was worth about 20, 50 cents. Um, it doesn't need the attention. This is not how we want to kick it off. And WikiLeaks listened. Uh, they struggled through it. They had no funding. They were just burning through their funding. Uh, but eventually, um, in June of 2011, WikiLeaks had two choices, either accept Bitcoin or go under and stop the operation, and they accepted Bitcoin. Ironically, the same week that WikiLeaks started accepting Bitcoin, uh, anyone know who this is? Schumer. This is Chuck Schumer. This is, uh, unfortunately, from my state. Uh, so, he was very irate at this thing called Silk Road. And he went on TV, on CNBC or NBC, I don't remember, and did like a five minute video about how everyone is purchasing drugs from Silk Road. Uh, he pulled up the website, he was, uh, I wish I could play the video, but uh, the software only plays YouTube videos, and uh, we still have copyright laws, I could not find this on, uh, I could only find it on the CNBC website. Uh, but look it up. Uh, he's very irate, and he's basically showing people in a five minute video how to use Silk Road, uh, what currency it uses, Bitcoin, and how people get Bitcoin to buy things from Silk Road. Uh, needless to say, over the next month, the traffic on Silk Road basically went up 10 to 100 fold. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, this was probably the best advertising for Bitcoin, for Silk Road, they could have possibly asked for. It was running on all the news channels. Uh, so between this and WikiLeaks, uh, this kind of kicked off uh, the very first move of Bitcoin 
um, into double digits. This was actually happening in 2011, where the price of Bitcoin went all the way to $30, and then dropped back down to two, and I'm picking it up here from two. Um, so that was the very first bubble. Those that saw it, that was like a 97% fall from 32 down to two, and uh, people thought it was over. After that, we started to go up again, and in 2012, we have uh, China. So this is where um, China begins to open up their exchanges. The first exchange in China was BTC China, and then later it was joined by OKCoin and Hobi, and those are the exchanges that are really driving up the price even today. Um, and that initial China entry spiked the price up in 2012. A lot of, there was a lot of activity in China, um, and we went to 13 to seven, to seven dollars. Now something really interesting started happening in 2013, and this wasn't exactly clear till more recently this year when more evidence came out. Uh, because remember, Mt. Gox was the very first exchange, um, and I really liked what Aaron was saying in the previous presentation. Some people love Mt. Gox and some people hate it. Uh, my personal, I did, in my personal uh, opinion, I actually did not have any uh, Bitcoins on Mt. Gox, so I wasn't financially, um, uh, I, I didn't suffer financially from that collapse. Um, I have met a person and she lost all her Bitcoins that were there, about a thousand Bitcoins. And um, she's, she still loves Bitcoin, looking to get back in. Um, so um, the Mt. Gox collapse did not stop people from believing in Bitcoin. I personally think Mt. Gox did an amazing job in the beginning. They actually brought Bitcoin to the forefront, created the first exchange. Um, I still give them a lot of credit, wouldn't be here today. and. Um, as far as regulation goes, our regulators are always behind. They're still trying to create regulation to prevent the next Mt. Gox, which will never happen again. Um, it was too big, it had way too much volume, it's already spread out. The exchanges are more focused on privacy and security. Uh, the latest hacks, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, they, they got less than 5%. So it's uh, those kinds of problems. Regulators will always be behind. Uh, they're still trying to you know, get the Dodd Frank Act from the 2008 financial crisis um, nine years later, and guess what? That problem isn't happening again. The next financial crisis in the fiat world is going to be something you don't expect. It, it's never the same thing twice. Uh, you usually get the same kind of crisis after everyone that has seen what will happen is dead. So the next crisis is going to be more like the 1930s because no one alive remembers it. That's the only time they repeat. Uh, crises don't, aren't actually the same ever, because people that are alive have memories. Uh, so around 2013, it's now evident that Mt. Gox uh, was hacked back in 2011, amongst other things, and this is when their willy bots started uh, doing some work um, under the table in their exchange, and that started to drive up the price a little bit, and they were heavily assisted by an event in the current financial world. And that was the event of Cyprus. This happened in March and April of 2013. Uh, this is actually when I finally got off my ass and uh, went on local Bitcoins and finally picked up my first Bitcoins, even though I've been hearing about it since the 2011 days of uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, but this is where um, a lot of people that I know joined as well. This is where a lot of the, early, the second wave of uh, adopters came. 2013, uh, mostly because of Cyprus, uh, where their banks closed and anyone with over 100,000 euros got taxed at like 40%, they just confiscated it. And I remember sitting in the office and I'm like, wow, that's just going to be happening at every country, first in Europe, then the US, and the PhDs in my office, they're like, no, nah, it would never happen here, we're not, we're not Argentina, we're not, we're not Cyprus, we're not Greece. Uh, no, it's, it's going to happen here later, but... Uh, via all these systems are the same. Um, so that, that drove the price all the way up to 250, and then boom, there's the, there's the crash. This is what happens when prices go exponential. The thing is, no one knows where it's gonna end, right? This could have gone all the way to $1,000, just nobody knows. Uh, when it started to fall down, um, again, I personally was buying it up on this rise. I thought, I, this is when I finally thought Bitcoin was serious and it's not going anywhere. Uh, the prices kind of came down for a while. This was actually the low intraday. This was the low end of day close. Uh, this spike right here where we fell from 120 down to 85 in one day. Uh, anybody remember what happened here? Or what day it was? Silk Road. 
That's the Silk Road. That's the takedown of Silk Road. Anyone remember the day? October? October 1st. October 1st. Um, and I remember this day clearly because I went to work and all my coworkers are still making fun of me for um, being involved in Bitcoin. And one of the guys actually came up to me and said, hey, so Silk Road's down. Uh, well, you can't buy drugs with Bitcoin, so now what is it good for? Um, that was basically, what are you going to do with your Bitcoins now? You, you, can't, um, you can't buy the only thing that it's good for. Uh, which was completely ridiculous and actually this set off the rise. Uh, now, of course, the Wooly Bach had a lot to do with that as well. So was the volume in China. And this is where Japan no longer has an exchange. Uh, the US exchanges are being shut down left and right. Trade hill goes down. Bit instant goes down. Um, some of the other ones closed operations, I already forgot the name of them, but all of the U.S. exchanges are facing regulatory pressure after everyone watches Charlie Shrimp get arrested, which was also ridiculous, but save that for another presentation. Um, and uh, China becomes the only player in town, um, and that's when we reach our final bubble at 1200 For about half a day, a price of a Bitcoin was $2 more than one ounce of gold. On Mount Gox, which was $100 higher than any other exchange. Um, and then the prices begin to come down, and this is really interesting, uh, the way the prices started to come down. Um, so I have a little, everyone knows supply and demand, right, the typical supply and demand. Um, but in Bitcoin, it's a little bit different than that, because the Bitcoin price, yes, it still follows the same law of uh, supply and demand, uh, but what is demand in the Bitcoin space? Demand in the Bitcoin space is new users coming into Bitcoin, uh, buying Bitcoin, um, saving Bitcoin, using it for commerce. Um, that's demand, but what's supply? We all know that Bitcoins are still being mined, um, so at the moment it's still inflationary. There's more Bitcoins being mined on a daily basis than there's really a need to use them. And it was more so uh, back then. I think this is where the halving took place as well in 2013. That also added to the rise. I forgot to mention that. Um, so the, the way the halving added to the rise, in my opinion, is not that there are now less Bitcoins in circulation, is that it was the very first halving. And from what I've been reading, people weren't sure if the code was gonna work. Uh, so a lot of the, the, the price is confidence. The facts don't matter to traders, to speculators. It's all rumors and it's all speculation. Um, yes, there are fundamental events that can drive it, the unexpected events, but in general, most of the prices, you think what it's gonna be later, not what it's right now. Um, so a lot of it is speculation. The speculation in early 2013 was, well, is it gonna work? Is the halving gonna work? So remember, if the halving doesn't work that day, price of Bitcoin would probably drop to like back to cents. Because a lot there was a lot of depend a lot of things were dependent on that halving. Um, so as we go down, so the supply is actually mined coins, but more importantly, the supply is merchant selling. And um, I believe, um, who was it? Um, Daniel, were you talking about, um, oh, I'm trying to remember all the presentations. Uh, merchants that sell Bitcoins aren't really part of the Bitcoin economy? Uh, yeah. There you go. Uh, so I completely agree with that. Uh, so any merchant that only accepts Bitcoin and immediately uses Coinbase or uh, BitPay to convert it to cash, they're actually adding to the supply of Bitcoins because they market sell and you need new users to pick them up. So if, uh, and that's what happened. In 2013, there weren't that many merchants. There was a lot of demand for Bitcoin, but this supply part wasn't even there. Uh, but merchants started to come on board once the price started to go up and people wanted to spend. Uh, this actually kills the whole inflation model, right? Because Bitcoin was so deflationary and everybody wanted to spend them because they were worth so much money. It's the opposite of what the Federal Reserve is making you think that, oh, prices need to be lower in the future for people to go out and spend. Bitcoin proved the exact opposite. As Bitcoin was going up, more people were wanting to use it. They didn't have places to use them. In 2014, all these merchants started to come online. So guess what happens? People are spending their Bitcoins. They're getting immediately liquidated. There's not enough demand, not enough new users. Um, and it started to go down. So um, I believe this was uh, September, September 2013. Uh, this was an article on Cointelegraph where I had a debate with one of the other uh, writers 
And I was basically saying, because this is the rumors of PayPal getting involved in Bitcoin and uh, allowing all their merchants of PayPal to accept Bitcoin. And I basically said, if that happens, the price of Bitcoin is going for like five or ten dollars. Uh, because if people can spend their Bitcoins anywhere right now, there's not enough demand. It would literally just drive the price down. So with all these merchants accepting Bitcoin, immediately liquidating, uh, this would be really, really bad for the price. So I was really bearish for the price because uh, all these merchants were coming on board and immediately liquidating. Uh, luckily, PayPal did not get into Bitcoin. Um, I'm not even sure Braintree is fully functional yet for Bitcoin. I don't know why it's taking them so long. This is what happens when a nice small company gets acquired by a big company. Uh, they can no longer innovate. Um, so, let me go back one. So here's our chart coming down. Remember, this is logarithmic scale. This is actually pretty big, which is why on this chart, I left a linear scale. So what you see in blue is the price of Bitcoin on a linear scale. This was the bubble to 2000. Uh, this was the Cypress bubble to 250. This is the Mount Gox collapse bubble to uh, over a thousand. Uh, and I have it on a backdrop of another asset. And the scale of that asset is going from about 8 to about 54. Those who haven't seen this presentation before, uh, want to take a guess at what this backdrop asset is? Silver. Gold. Not gold. Silver. Silver. Okay, this is silver. And uh, if you look, um, I just match up the peaks. I mean, this is, what a this is how a typical bubble Falls. Um, you have this base right here, which is right there. You have this lower base, which is right here. Um, and then we start to go down slower. And then we finally have this big drop that happened right there. And now we are finally starting um, to have some divergence. Uh, the only difference between these charts is the time scale. Bitcoin is just doing everything that silver did from its drop from 50 to $10 or 13 um, Bitcoin is just doing it three times faster. And this is, of course, the typical uh, view of a bubble. Um, we have this initial one, which I guess we can say the 250, and then we have the big one, and then we have that return to range, um, and then we have the big fall. So sometimes I raise this question, and so where is Bitcoin on this chart? And the best answer I got one was, it's all the way on the left, we haven't really seen this yet. Um, which again is possible, right? Uh, but bubbles can go on and on and on. Um, because anyone thinks we have the mania phase yet? I don't think so. It's mostly technology, though, between the Willy Bot and no, no places to spend Bitcoin. I personally don't think, I don't know if the mania phase will come, but I certainly don't think that it hit the world yet. Um, so, and again, looking back at this, you have this initial fall and then it goes back up. Uh, this is that return to range step. Um, so yeah, so this follows the typical pattern of a collapsing bubble. Um, now, there's also a lot of trader-driven volatility as well. Uh, there's also leverage exchanges are coming on board. People can now short. They can go uh, 20x long, 50x long. Um, so a lot of things are happening. I personally think that short selling is incredibly important. It's the short sellers that stop the fall because they're buying it back for profit. And no one complains about short sellers when they have to cover their positions and driving the price up. Uh, a market needs to be dynamic. Uh, short selling needs to be just as important as long. Of course, you have to prove that you're borrowing assets to short. I don't like naked short or at least have the assets to back up the naked short. Uh, provable assets in escrow. Okay, so now uh, we, we have this big drop to 150 in early January. This was uh, very interesting and I'm gonna talk about that um, in a minute. Uh, we went back up, I should have updated this. We're now back to about 315. Um, I think I last updated this about a month or two ago. I just gave this presentation in Denver last week at another conference, which is why the, this one says Denver. I think this, I started doing this earlier this year. Um, so I can't believe how often I have to update this our backdrop to the entire presentation. Um, so let's talk about the future. So once again, I'm taking you guys to Europe, and uh, the next event that will drive uh, Bitcoin adoption will be a uh, collapse of the Greek banking system and the shutdown of their banks. Um, wait, that happened? It did, right? It happened this summer. 
Um, the reason why I still say it like that, this is the last time I'm gonna say it like that. I'm being sarcastic because the very first time I gave this presentation was in, uh, for the Anarcho-Polco conference in February of this year. Um, I think the only person I recognize is Mark Edge, who's probably outside doing the radio. Um, and that's exactly what I said. I said, this summer, uh, when the Greek banks shut down, um, expect Bitcoin to go up, and not even because the Greeks are running out to buy Bitcoin. When your banking system is shut down, you want to buy food, you're not buying Bitcoin. But guess what? Greece is just one little country with a global GDP of about 0.3%. It's not the Greeks that are going to run out to buy Bitcoin, it's the Italians who are probably next, and they're much bigger. And if not the Italians, we got Spain and Portugal, and if anyone thinks that uh, Germany or France are in better shape, they're not. Uh, this entire region is, uh, this entire socialist region is in serious trouble. All their banks are connected. The sovereign debt crisis is really gonna hit them. Um, so, um, once the Greek crisis already hit, I mean, it's the Italians and the Spanish that are paying attention. And once Italy gets hit, it's the Spanish and the French and the Germans that are gonna say, you know what, we might be next. Uh, Bitcoin can be very, very useful. But it's useful in more ways than that, because again, like I said, I'm expecting this entire region to collapse. And what happens when a region collapses, and this is what uh, Paul Rosenberg was talking about earlier today, people move, people migrate. Uh, we haven't seen uh, a global migration of people in our lifetime, but it's happened. Uh, during World War II, people moved to move away from their countries, and that generation is dying off. Um, so like I said earlier, uh, things happen in a cycle and they don't repeat um, in your life cycle. They repeat when the generation that remembers what happened is no longer with us, because history will always repeat. And um, why would people move? And these are just some of the recent headlines. Uh, this, is, uh, this is George Galloway, who's running for mayor of London, and he's supposed to be the anti-war, the, uh, the somewhat libertarian, but guess what? He's actually very left-wing and he's following in the footsteps like Syriza to get, um, to get the UK off the Euro completely and out of the Eurozone. They're not on the Euro currency, but they're following the European law. Uh, but guess how did that work out for Greece? I mean, uh, Alexei Tsipras got, uh, got elected because he said he would get Greece out of the Euro, and guess what happened? He followed it, he took the bribe like everybody else. Uh, he took the IMF money, um, and I don't know if you guys have read or saw the book, uh, confessions of an economic hitman of what happens when you take IMF's money. Um, so here's some of the policies he's promoting. Like, they always promote one good thing they can't do. He's like, I'm gonna put the government on the blockchain, which is the perfect use case for the blockchain. I wanna see where every tax dollar goes. Um, I think I was in North Carolina when someone had a presentation. He literally had a 45 minute presentation about um, all the fraud and all the criminal activity in Bitcoin. That was the title of his presentation. He literally went through 45 minutes of every fraud, every hack, every way that people were defrauded or people frauded in the Bitcoin space. And after his presentation, I just raised the question. I'm like, is it possible one of your lawyers or regulators will come up here and talk about uh, how Bitcoin can solve all the fraud in the public sector? Because it's significantly larger than the private sector. Um, because he can't do this right now, it's way too young. But what he will do is he will run Uber out of town. How's that for entrepreneurship? And this one is better. Um, on the housing area, for example, we need to purchase any house that is unlived in for a year to tackle, to tackle the prevalence of people basically buying houses in London. Um, a lot of it is Chinese money, but people are moving their capital and they're buying real estate, so his genius idea is to take away people's property, and this is a common misconception of hyperinflation. Everyone knows about Zimbabwe's hyperinflation? How many of you think it happened because they printed too much money? Wow, no hands, oh, a few hands. Um, no, what, what happens in a hyperinflation event, it's a political event. Um, Zimbabwe decided to take away property from rich people and give it to poor people. So anyone with money in Zimbabwe just left. They had no economy and they had to print money. 
Um, you always have the same thing happen in Germany. Everyone's like, oh, they're printing too much money, they go to hyperinflation. Now, hyperinflation is when the people of your country no longer believe in your government, and anyone with money and that can create jobs gets the hell out and, mi and migrates out. And that's when the government is forced to just keep printing forever. Uh, so here's some of the other policy, and this is why Bitcoin becomes so important as the means. That's the Bitcoin killer app. Move your hard-earned capital. There is nowhere you can put your capital right now that is safe from the government and the socialist governments are going broke. They're going after anything people can put money in. Uh, this is a new bill out of Germany. Germany is supposed to be the progressive. Um, or the, the one that cares about their people's value because they're, they actually work. Um, so let's see here. Germany's new proposed legislation um, is radical. Okay, so this amendment not only aims to combat illicit traffic and cultural objects in Germany, but uh, limiting ways of funding of terror organizations that are more and more financed by illegal excavation at archaeological sites, as well as by illicit trade and cultural materials. So they're basically saying that terrorist activity is funded by digging architectural artifacts. Okay? Now, obviously, this is insane. Uh, what they're doing is they're preventing anyone from hiding their capital in valuable goods. So they are making, uh, this is retroactive, as most laws are. So if you're any kind of a collector in Germany, art, ancient, anything, and it has value over $100, you need to register it. Who it belongs to, uh, where it came from, and if you don't know where it came from, then they can basically take it away. Um, so anything valuable over $100, you have to register it. Um, and then you will be, they don't say it here, but you will be taxed on it. You will be taxed by your net worth, and this becomes part of your net worth. And as all laws, there's a hefty penalty, jail time. Um, if you don't register something, they find, they find an ancient book in your house that they think is worth more than 100 euros, you're breaking federal law. Uh, here's France, um, and they're putting a hold, you can't use more than 1,000 euros to buy anything in cash. There's a huge war on cash right now. Uh, governments don't like cash. Cash has given them a lot of problems. Uh, the three main problems that um, I, I talk about, that cash is for government. One, um, without cash, they can set any monetary policy they want. Negative interest rates, fine. Negative 2%, 3%, doesn't matter. People can't go into cash to hide from negative interest rates. Um, basically, they want to charge you money for holding your money. Uh, the other thing is, without cash, you can't have a bank run. No cash, no ATMs, no one is going to stand in line. What are you going to do? Uh, you can't stand in line to get your cash, so no bank run. And the bigger, most important one is because all these governments are broke, they can instantly tax you because you can't hide in cash once again. Um, so this is Europe, and they put a provision in there for digital currencies as well. Um, if a Frenchman wants to uh, change money into another currency, it must still be 100 euro without identification. So anytime you're doing anything over a thousand euros, um, you have to identify yourself and then they know exactly what, what you're doing. Uh, the US is no different. There's a big war on cash in the US. This is a bill from Louisiana. Louisiana made the selling of secondhand goods illegal uh, for cash. So if you have a garage sale in Louisiana and you want to sell that toaster, you better not take that five bucks in cash. Uh, you better get a check or uh, you better find a way because uh, it's right here. A second-hand dealer shall not enter into any cash transactions uh, in payments for purchase of junk or used second-hand property. You basically cannot sell anything for cash. Uh, your taxes are going up as well. And again, it's a battle. You can move around between the states in the U.S. just like you can move around between countries in Europe. Um, but they need their taxes. Uh, I was going to North Carolina to speak at that event, and for the first time I noticed, why is Airbnb charging me taxes all of a sudden? And this is like a 20%, this added 25% to, uh, to my two nights in, uh, in North Carolina. And North Carolina is actually known for lowering their taxes, their corporate taxes, to bring industry in. Um, but Airbnb was forced to, uh, to charge taxes, and look at these things. It's like five of them. Um, so taxes are slowly going up everywhere. Uh, New Jersey put in an exit tax and there's like articles that nobody really understands what it is. Uh, but supposedly if you're worth any kind of money and you want to leave New Jersey to move to another state, 
Uh, they're gonna, if they think you're worth too much, they're just gonna charge you, they're gonna tax you up to leave a state. Uh, something else that very interesting happened while I was booking that room in Airbnb and the taxes showed up, um, I had to agree to uh, terms of service for uh, the Airbnb, a new terms of service popped up. And usually you just click agree and not care. I just happened to notice the scroll bar was significantly smaller than I'm used to. So I decided to copy and paste the terms of service into Microsoft Word and then waited about 45 seconds for Microsoft Word to count the amount of words um, inside the terms of service. And it was just under 33,000 words and 55 pages. Now this is Airbnb, a website I've been using almost from the beginning when it first came out. Uh, so in a comparison to some of the other things that we know of, um, the U.S. Constitution with all 27 amendments is only 7,800 words. And my previous uh, one, and I got this, I got these top ones uh, from a website called Mish. Uh, uh, well, his name is Mish. Uh, he's a great um, economics blogger. And uh, EU regulation on the sale of cabbage is actually 26,000 words. Um, and this is what happens, regulation just gets insane. Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, by the way, is only 3,400 words. And uh, that gave us Bitcoin. So you can compare what, uh, this, this, this is what lawyers do, basically. This is different from their privacy policy. That was an additional like, 5,000 words or something like that. Um, something ridiculous as well. But the king of all government regulation, and this is why nobody understands government regulation, uh, this is a bill that was recently passed through Congress. Guesses that have not seen this presentation? What this bill is? No, no it is not the Patriot Act. I'm sure that one's pretty long as well. No, that frank is significantly small. This is the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. I believe this is 33,000 pages. And this is why nobody knows what is in it. Because no one has successfully managed to read this. Um, I don't even think that Bitcoin developers can uh, sift through this with code. This is just uh, something else. And uh, again, regulation is uh, hitting all of us. I don't know if anyone has seen this before. Um, so at the bottom, a little disclaimer. I confirm that I am not a resident of Iran, Syria, North Korea, or the state of New York. Uh, this is in light of the bid license. Uh, this is Volturo. Uh, uh, they basically, they're, uh, they're gold and uh, Bitcoin, so that you can uh, purchase gold with uh, Bitcoin. But again, this is the, this is their nice little disclaimer. I couldn't help but put it in the slides. Um, so what does it mean? So what happens when um, regulation and taxes get out of control? Uh, people move. People take their hard-earned capital and they move somewhere else where they can be free. Uh, this is a chart from uh, Martin Armstrong, which is also uh, my favorite financial personality in this space. Um, I try to bring his name up and get more people to read his work. Um, he's uh, an amazing forecaster. He's got a movie uh, called The Forecaster. It's a documentary. And uh, I strongly recommend it. And uh, he had an economic model that was predicting when things would fall. And the uh, government and the court system wanted it. And he holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most time spent in jail for contempt of court, prison for contempt of court. Uh, because he wouldn't give up the source code that he wrote to his model. Um, and then he did an additional five years after that because they kind of didn't want to let him out. Uh, which is why a lot of people haven't heard of him. Uh, but he has this chart. This is the population of Rome. Um, around 400 AD, the population of Rome was 1.5 million. And then Rome collapsed, just like a lot of others, because they promised too much. Remember, the debt, the U.S. debt, let's talk about the U.S., even though global matters. Uh, the U.S. debt is about 18, 19 trillion. That is not a lot. The U.S. has a thriving economy. We have a lot of businesses. The debt is not big, but uh, it's the unfunded liabilities. Uh, it's 120 plus trillion in unfunded liabilities that we know of, that they owe. Uh, and that's one of the reasons what happened with Rome. Uh, most of the government employees back then were soldiers, and when their pensions kept getting cut and the currency kept being devalued, the soldiers basically came back to Rome, and A, they sacked their own city, wanted their own money back, and B, they didn't protect the city, so the barbarians were coming in and raiding the cities, and people just got the hell out of Rome. They took what coins they could, they left Rome, and the population of Rome bottomed out a thousand years later at about 20,000 people. That is a 98% drop, and 
Remember this chart right here, the bubble chart? And then it falls and it's like, oh no, we're back to normal. Well, guess what? There it is. We fall, we're going back up, we're back to normal. No, we're not. Go back down. Okay? So it's, uh, bubbles happen everywhere. This is, like I said, this is population. Um, so when people move, they have to take their capital with them. Uh, and this is where gold gives you a bit of a problem. Because this is a customs form. Um, I purposely took out the name of the country because it doesn't matter. I give it another few years and this will be in every country. And on your customs form as you're on the flight, do you have any gold bullion? Are you wearing any gold jewelry above the allowed amount? I mean, gold is difficult to transport. And you can't transport it. Uh, government has technology too. Gold was great pre-electricity. It was pretty good with electricity, pre-metal detectors. Now there's metal detectors, now you can't do anything. Uh, so this is where Bitcoin has, uh, has a real niche to, for people to move their capital. And I'm not sure why they're upset about satellite phones, but that's, uh, again, government. Um, <laughs> who knows what they do. Now here is an interesting headline. This is when Greece was falling. This is from TechCrunch. Both articles are from TechCrunch. For people to move their capital. This one is in February, around the time I first started talking about Greece collapsing and Bitcoin being a use case. Here's an article from TechCrunch. Why Greece should not switch to Bitcoin. And then here's an article about a month after uh, the Greek banking system goes down from the same publication. Uh, Bitcoin provider Qubits aims to help Greeks move their money. Okay, so this is an entrepreneur and this is obviously someone that believes in uh, that the state will solve all their problems. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of these because we're going to see a lot more situations like Greece. All right, so to finish this off, let's talk about the price a little bit. This is an article I wrote over a year ago. Uh, again, back then I was writing for Cointelegraph. Um, on August 31st, so this is now going on 14 months, and it was an introduction to time. And I was trying to time when will the stock price, uh, have, stock price, sorry, Bitcoin price, um, have a significant turn in its trend. And I was following uh, the analysis that Martin Armstrong kind of invented, and remember, at the time, Bitcoin was like 600 bucks, coming off a thousand. So the time analysis dictated that June 2015, um, and specifically June 15th, 15, 16, 2015, if you dig into this number right here, 2015.46 uh, years, um, Bitcoin price would have a significant change in trend. But at the time, I didn't know. When I did this presentation again, um, at the, this was written in August of last year. When I did this presentation in February of this year, it was then pretty clear that we're going into the low. Back at the time, Bitcoin price was very like 220. Um, so that's, that's where I was looking for the bottom, and that's actually when Greece fell, um, right around that time. And here was the chart that I initially did in Acapulco in February. This is February right here. This is when I first started putting this chart to the public. And what I was expecting was a fall, a rise right here. This was a less likely secondary move. I was looking for an up move and then a, and then a fall down to the low 100s. I was looking for a fall in the Bitcoin price to the low 100s. Uh, and that's only because of this event here. Uh, this was the move I was looking for to bottom out the price, but I was expecting it in June, not in January. Uh, so that, but again, it's not easy trying to forecast the price. Um, so I was looking for a move down, but on this day, I was expecting the price to start to go up. We went sideways, and on this day, we started to go up. Um, and then this right here, this big fall, is the unfortunate result of the Bitcoin XT. This is the potential fork, um, and I was very vocal about that, that that was the cause of the panic, and a lot of people didn't agree with me. And they're like, no, it's not that, because developers and uh, people that aren't traders, they still have a hard time understanding that facts don't mean much to speculators and traders. You just have a real time to understand that. Uh, Aaron, your question? Bitfinex crashed a little bit too. Oh, no, that was Bitfinex. That was mostly Bitfinex. Yeah, this, this was the, the people were over leveraged long, people started selling, and they had technical issues. But that wasn't my um, initial, this right here is Bitfinex, this is a Bitfinex chart. But what happened was, a week later, Bitstamp had a lower low. Um, and that's how you know it's not just one exchange. Because if it was one exchange, we would have rebounded. But if, if this chart was a different exchange, like Bitstamp, 
Um, the low right here, a, few, a week later, was lower than the fall on that day when Bitfinex was crashing. And this is when you know people did not have confidence in Bitcoin. And this was all the talk about the Bitcoin XD. Um, so the next time I, I did this presentation was probably in Chicago around uh, June, July of this year. And a few people were there. And I was looking for the Bitcoin price to fall from that 315 range to go back up to 340. And I thought we were on the way there and the Bitcoin XT release uh, really hit me by surprise. Um, so that threw in a little bit of a curveball. Uh, but I am looking for this rise. Now, this was the chart I did one week ago. And the price was only at 277. And you can still see the arrow right here going into 340. And then I'm looking for a move down before setting us up for more, for higher prices. So this was a week ago, I spoke in Denver and I had this chart. So I had to update it this morning. And here's the update. That is the same exact arrow. Um, so I actually didn't expect it to go up this high a few weeks ago. And uh, I think we did pop out yesterday. Um, and I think we're gonna come back down to earth a little bit. Um, and then we go back up, okay? And uh, this is the kind of stuff I write about with these charts um, at Brave New Coin. Uh, this is uh, the newsletter from Brave New Coin. It was free for a little while, now it's a paywall. I gotta get some codes for people in the audience for like a week or two. Um, I write this weekly, it's a seven page traders report where, uh, uh, where I have my views on, uh, on the short, medium, and long term of the price. And those, kind, and those kinds of charts are in it. Um, and that is uh, the end of my presentation. I will gladly take some questions if there's time. I know I'm holding you up for lunch. Um, but if there are any questions, um, feel free to shoot them my way. Oh, and just one more thing. I have, uh, I have one t-shirt on me from, uh, for free Ross uh, in my bag. It's a donation straight to uh, help Ross Ulbricht's uh, retrial of the case. Uh, because the federal agents that were investigating Sol Crow got arrested after his trial ended and his lawyers were not allowed to bring that up even though they knew that was happening. So they're going for a retrial. Um, so I think the t-shirt um, goes by 20 or 25 donations straight to um, Ross's charity if anyone is interested to contribute. Um, so on that note, um, I will take a question if I have time. I see Susan with her hand up. So these are not very specific. I'm looking for the, the, the way trading happens is we have something, I have these lines that has a support and resistance yeah. and they act kind of like magnets in both directions for the basics of trading. I have other presentations where I teach people what all these things are and uh, all these chart patterns. And uh, right here we are way over a board. Right here we are way over a board. Look what happened last time we were in this area. Here's what happened the previous time we were in this area. And uh, here's the time before that, it wasn't even as high. Now we can look at this indicator. Let's go one back when we got out of the yellow, we were here. We didn't even get to the yellow, we were here. We were just above the yellow, we were here. Is that RSI or? Something? That this is the RSI and this is the MACD. Um, keep it to the basics. Uh, we are clearly overbought, guys. I mean, it's not a new paradigm. We're not going to 10,000 tomorrow unless all of the Europe collapses and people move their money. Um, so I, I think this is it. I really thought that we weren't even gonna get this high. I thought we were gonna take a little break right here. Uh, it didn't happen one further up. Uh, we're not gonna go exponential. Sorry, sorry to disappoint you. Not, not today, not tomorrow. I'm leaving now. Um, <laughs> um, I think the future is very bright, but um, it's not gonna go up right away. Um, so I am expecting a fall, and the way things usually fall, they fall back down to levels that have previously been significant. And the 250 has been very significant. Um, so I'm looking for a fall to at least 300. Um, I, would, I actually would be happy if it fell to 250, and then reverse from there, and hopefully have a good closeout to the year. We got a question over here. Is it, is it purely psychological that the, the support and um, the, the, the levels fall to previously significant levels, or is it, or is it that because there was significant trading there, that's where people just 
now should we dip back in or out? So it's both. It's both. It's always a combination of the two. Uh, when a lot of traders are looking at the same chart, they're going to force something that you expect. And if too many people are expecting something, it always does the exact opposite. Um, usually in trading, the moment it's clear to everyone, that is not what's going to happen. You really got to be contrarian sometimes. So, uh, And I know people that cashed out at the top at $800 of Bitcoin. I know people that cashed out. And I know people that thought that when Bitcoin made it to $20, they thought it would, it would never go higher, and that's when they cashed out. So again, um, there is some luck involved in trading. The successful traders are just consistent. They have their uh, patterns that they consistently follow, and they know they're not going to hit them all the time. But hey, if, you pot, if uh, a casino can build this, with uh, what, a 2 to 3% advantage on most games if the players play them to buy the book. Um, in trading, all you gotta do is be right 60% of the time and you can make a lot of money as long as you are consistent. I was gonna say the uh, other thing uh, beyond um, those, those levels that you indicated is kind of shape of, of, of a price action. So for instance, when you're calling down, uh, we hit 330, um, futures we hit 360, and. It's basically exponential um, from the last week, and you just don't ex expect exponential growth in a week with no news. So right. It's just like almost intuition, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, th those levels are definitely um, are there, but you can also say, okay, well, why is now Bitcoin selling uh, at 10 times the volume this week? What happened? Right. And, and nothing happened. So exactly. I completely agree with Aaron, and uh, I wrote just that in my uh, traders report last week, I basically said, yes, it could go exponential tomorrow, but there's no way I'm gonna call for an exponential rise. That just doesn't happen, unless I saw Europe collapsing, or unless I saw people in London taking away property, or, uh, or uh, the government in the US taking away people's guns. Unless there's like a real reason uh, to move your, um, there's a real reason for real capital flight, uh, I don't think we get upset at me, I'm sorry. Remittance to the Philippines is not gonna be the next wave of Bitcoin adoption. Um, I, 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 I know I'm kind of mean to people when I say that. Um, it's people with some money that can start businesses and that create jobs. And when those people move, and if you ask me, um, you're gonna move somewhere where there is infrastructure or the beginning of infrastructure and not the big social programs. So I'm looking at Southeast Asia, even China, and next level is Africa, because South America just can't get their shit together. Uh, they just have currency crisis after currency crisis. Um, and anyone that says, oh, China is building all these ghost cities and they're just wasting money, well, guess what? When people run away from the Europe and the US, just like they ran away from Europe to come to the US, where there was nothing, when all those people start moving to China, they'll be glad there are those ghost cities right now. All right, great. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. Michael, Michael Turpin. Oh, quick, quick, I'll, I'll answer right there. Perhaps not quite causing the next big uh, boom. How about things like people trying to get money out of China with Macau's being sort of... Right, right, that, that's the real adoption. It's people, people with money. Uh, sending $100 back, uh, I mean, it's great. I want everyone to be banked. It's great that they can have banks. But uh, money going back to the Philippines for people to eat is not what's gonna drive the next technological wave. Uh, it's the entrepreneurs, it's the next Zuckerberg that wants to program privacy software and it gets everybody off of Facebook. And if he's able to build it with Bitcoin as the backbone, uh, that's what's gonna drive the real Bitcoin adoption. Um, and that's gonna set off the wave. Like it always has in history, it's the entrepreneurs that leave uh, these tyrannical regimes go to freer nations with capital, with ideas uh, that build the businesses. It's not, uh, it's not people that are just working and sending money back for their family to eat. Um, it's great, I think it's, it's amazing that it does that, but as a speculator, as someone that's looking for what is gonna take Bitcoin to $10,000 of Bitcoin, it's the, it's the entrepreneurship, it's the it's people that have saved a few hundred thousand dollars worth equivalent to US and Euro and need to get it out of the country.